Full to order the Highland Park Board of Education hybrid regular public meeting for uh, March 20th. Oh, here we go. <laughs> I forget what I have to do next. Tell me about that. Um, the New Jersey Open Public Meetings Act. It must be on the. Here we go. The New Jersey Open Public Meetings Act was enacted to ensure the right of the public to have advance notice of and to attend the meeting of the public bodies at which any business affecting their interest is discussed or acted upon. In compliance with the Open Public Meetings Act, the Highland Park Board of Education has caused notice of this meeting, setting forth the time, date, and location. Oh, thank you. Time, date, and location. Um, <laughs> to be submitted for publication to the Home News Tribune and Star Ledger and post on the board's website at least 48 hours in advance of this meeting. Members of the public who wish to address the board will be given the opportunity to do so before the board adjourns for the evening. We have a roll call. Ms. Casal Dunn. Ms. Coleman. Ms. Gowan. Here. Mr. Krieger. Here. Ms. Ekvanaji Nicola. Ms. Pruce. Here. Mr. Roslevich. Here. Ms. Voorhees. Mr. Woodward. Here. Be it resolved pursuant to the Sunshine Act, NJSA 10 4 12 and 13, the Highland Park Board of Education will now meet in closed session to discuss matters related to HIB, student discipline, and legal matters. These exemptions are permitted to be discussed in closed session in accordance with NJSA 10 uh, 4 13. Information regarding the board's closed session discussion will be disclosed to the public as soon as the need for confidentiality no longer exists. So I move that we uh, convene to executive session. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay, thank you. Okay, I move that we be convened to regular public uh, session. Do I have a second? Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 One nation, under God, indivisible, liberty, and justice for all. We have one communication to the board this month um, uh, related to our busing and scheduling questions. And then, just for information's sake, that, that we, have, uh, we obviously have our emails, of course, for the month, but that is one that goes to the entire board and the superintendent. And the business administrator, that board at the East Schools that we will be looking at the plus administration. Uh, otherwise, it's emails to come to individuals or just the superintendent, but uh, on the agenda, that's what we report. We need to approve minutes for the hybrid public workshop meeting February 6th and the uh, February 27th regular and executive sessions. So I make a motion that we approve those minutes. Second. Yes, yes. Ms. Goldman? Yes. Ms. Gowan? Yes. Mr. Krieger? Yes. Ms. McFadden, do you follow? Yes. Ms. Bruce? Yes. Mr. Rizlevich? Yes. Ms. Morgis? Yes. Mr. Woodman? Yes. Okay, and then we move on to your student representative reports. And then you gave us a lot, but <laughs> we can get more you want to add. So for early on Tuesday, all our writers are off their socks to support those who learn and pray. We have so much off this world, the world down to the grave. And also we look forward to our spring play dance on March 30th. On April 5th, we will have our annual neurodiversity global party. This day supports the idea that people experience and interact with the world around them in many different ways. At Bardo School, save the date for the Parent Guardian Workshop for Social Emotional Learning Night on Wednesday, March 29th from 6 to 7 p.m. at Bardo's Media Center. Come learn about what social emotional learning, SEL, is and ways to support your child. Every attendee will go home with fidgets and more. These takeaways are sponsored by the HPEA's Pride. And HPEA Fast and Bardo hosts Bingo for Books. Join us for one night of bingo and prizes for all Bardo students and families on Tuesday, April 4th from 5.30 p.m. to 6.30 p.m. in the Bardo cafeteria. For the middle school, the Glow Junior class is hosting a t-shirt sale. We'll be raffling three to five dollar gift cards to any student who buys a shirt. And paper tutoring is a new platform we are using to provide tutoring to students after hours. Um, 
On April 20th from 6 to 7 p.m., Empower Somerset is hosting a virtual baking and tobacco prevention event for middle school and high school youth and their parents. They have a great keynote speaker, Rob Holiday, and we will be giving away prizes throughout the event. Highland Park Police is running a youth academy. The academy is for students entering into fifth grade to students in the 10th grade. They then offer 10th and 12th grade students the opportunity to help out for community service hours. The second grade social is coming up next month on Tuesday, April 4th from 3 to 4 30 p.m. They are hosting a community health fair occurring at the Highland Park Community Center on March 21st from 1 to 3 p.m. In partnership with St. Peter's Hospital and Highland Park Borough, this health fair is taking place. The fair is meant to connect community members to help resources they might need, they might, they might be in need of in, in a more convenient setting. Say. And finally, for the high school, spring break is in two weeks from April 5th to April 14th. April 5th will also be the last day of marking Fair 3. The Red Cross Club will be having a blood drive on March 31st from 8 a.m. to 1 p.m. at the high school gym. You can sign up via redcrossblood.org or see Ms. Young or a Red Cross Club officer for more inquiries. DECA is selling t-shirts to fundraise for their competition in Florida. We see Ms. Chirico if you have any questions, and they will be selling drinks in collaboration with GLOW called Bubbles and Sparkles. And lastly, the time of the month period project in the Teen Center will be hosting a menstrual product drive to help end period poverty. The products will be collected during the month of March, Women's History Month. Pink bins will be located at the front doors of the high school near the cafeteria. Products will be given to the National Council of Jewish Women to be distributed to a local domestic violence shelter. Please donate virtual products during the month of March to help end period poverty. Thank you. Yeah, but there wouldn't be any more. This is really important. Any questions for our different students? Thank you. That's great. Okay. Uh, we're going to move on to the superintendent's report. It's pretty lengthy tonight. We've got some students to honor, and then we'll have a budget presentation and a four day after field presentation. Yeah. Yeah. So first I'd like to um, begin with student spotlight uh, for Bartle Elementary. Unfortunately, Ms. Knapp is not able to attend. Uh, she uh, was really, really upset when she called me this morning um, that she had an emergency health-related issue that needed her immediate attention. Um, so she apologizes. So I'm going to go to the podium and do some student spotlight. But I see some Bartle teachers. Are they here to help me? Sure. So I'll do that first, and we'll do our All right, so I'm really excited. First, uh, Eli Backenroth. So Eli, I'm trying to uh, share some information about you <laughs> so that everybody can see you here. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you so much for coming. All right, so this is what Ms. Knapp uh, had, uh, wants me to share about Eli. Eli has been a member of the Student Council for the past two years. He has a passion for helping people and spreading kindness. Because of Eli's passion for helping people, the Student Council was able to raise over $1,100 for a children's hospital program. He was determined to get this project off the ground, and while the Student Council was not able to make it happen last year, he persisted and made sure that the Student Council was able to complete it this year. Eli is always kind and compassionate. He's a wonderful student and a great friend for those reasons and more. He should have the spotlight shine on him all the time. Congratulations. <laughs> Spotlight from Marble is Auntie Cruz Martinez. <laughs> you like the spotlight being on you? Yeah. <laughs> well, I don't want to make this too short because we're really proud of your accomplishments. So stand proud and tall 
and be excited for the recognition. Angie is a student that always works hard and tries her best. She is determined and will even willingly complete extra work to improve her skills. Her hard work and determination have paid off this year, and her reading and academics have made a tremendous progress. Angie is a kind student that cares for others and is always willing to help. Angie, continue to work hard and shine bright. Congratulations. George lend a helping hand to the teachers and the students. He's such a kind student and always makes everyone smile. So sweet. His hard work has paid off this year as he continues to make progress toward his goals. She says, keep up the amazing work. Thank you for all your support at Bartle. Yeah. There it is, okay. <laughs> to have uh, Mr. Roy, I see Mr. Roy on the call with us, and Mr. Lassiter from the high school. Uh, Mr. Roy, I'm gonna pass the mic over to you. Mr. Roy is at home. Um, and we're just, so we're just gonna spotlight uh, a student's athlete recognition, and then I'll let everybody who doesn't want to stay quiet. <laughs> Exciting presentations on the preliminary budget and, back, and, the, and the aftercare program, of course, to, to leave, but I'd like us to stay and honor T. So, Mr. Roy, I'm going to pass the mic to you. All right. Hello, everybody. Great to see you. Um, I'm here to honor T. Atwater, who broke the Highland Park indoor 30 to 3200 meter record this past uh, winter season. Um, <laughs> which is quite an accomplishment. We've had a lot of incredible track and field athletes, you know, come through. Uh, T broke uh, Bella Goenish's record, who is running at Rutgers University right now as a senior. So that, that was a very hard record to break. Um, I did want to talk about um, all the special things that make T, T so unique. Um, one of them is being just an all-around great leader. Um, I heard the theme of kindness a lot with the Bartle School students, and T is all about just being a kind person. Uh, T is one of the kindest people I know. Um, T has had a commitment to, um, you know, running in track and field all year. T runs cross country, um, indoor track and field, and spring track. So uh, that's what makes T a great leader is that commitment to being the best runner that they can. Um, T also is always willing to try new things. Um, this past season in sectionals, T was, uh, came up to me and said, I want to do the, the mile and the two mile um, in one day, in one race. And I'm not a lot of distance runners um, do that. Um, T also exemplifies getting comfortable, feeling uncomfortable um, all the time. And, 
um, in practices, workouts, uh, in races. Um, you know, we always say that's where all the good things happen, um, just outside of your comfort zone. And T always um, is a leader in that way. T is never afraid um, to try something new, which is pretty remarkable. Um, I think one of the most special things about T is T's positive outlook. Um, when I talk to T about a race, um, T is always um, positive about what's about to happen. Um, this last year at States, when I told T, I, I, I think you could be anybody. T just had a huge smile. And I, I could see that T believed that everything I was saying. Um, T reflecting on performances. Um, you know, T's so positive about that too. Even if it's a bad race, T is always um, super positive to, to themselves about how that race went. Um, T has a go for it attitude all the time. Um, and in, in every race that she steps up and competes in. Um, and at Barrow School, we talk a lot about growth mindset, and she is the epitome of growth mindset. I don't think there's anyone I've ever coached who um, thinks in a growth mindset way as much as, as T does, um, that things aren't perfect right away. It takes time. Um, and in that and uh, you know, being willing to, to try new things. Um, so I, I, uh, I'm so happy that T is getting recognized here tonight. And this is one of the nicest parts about coaching is to um, you know, recognize the, the great, amazing athletes you have on your team. Um, and it's really nice to be recognized in front of everyone here. So I want to thank everyone on the board and Dr. Nicosia and Mr. Lasseter for giving us this opportunity to recognize um, someone really special. Um, and big congratulations to T for setting school record. <laughs> Congratulations, our Marvel Tooth Spotlight. Let's please all give them a round of applause again. So, of course, at this point, you are more than welcome to stay for the remainder of our meeting. However, no offense if you do. <laughs> Thank you, Ms. Leonardo. Thank you, Ms. Faces, for coming. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Mr. Roy, thank you, Mr. Lassner. Keep up that wonderful work. Keep up our, our great athletes going. You're doing amazing things. Thank you. Okay. All right. Um, I'm going to switch, switch your gears. Let me see if I can share screen. So we can turn the right presentation first. Am I okay? I'm like making sure. Am I everywhere I need to be? <laughs> okay. All right. Tonight, uh, Ms. Hopeful and I will be presenting the preliminary budget. So it is that season. I know last week you heard from the Finance and Facilities Committee about the uh, extensive meetings that they've. Uh, been attending to review um, the budget. Please note tonight the idea of a preliminary budget is to show that we balanced the budget. So what happens, we'll talk about the state funding we got, how we build the budget process, 
Um, we're going to talk about our preliminary, uh, preliminary options on what the budget is going to be based on, if we have some high ticket items or some changes. And again, tonight is just to show that uh, Ms. Hope did an amazing job of balancing our budget. She'll kind of speak to a little bit of that tonight. Then what happens after we present our preliminary budget to the, uh, the county superintendent's office, we then have about a month or so to a little over a month to dig deep to talk about those higher level decisions as a board before we make the final board presentation in the beginning of May or a vote. So that's just a little background about a preliminary budget. So in terms of the um, fiscal year budgeting process, uh, so we put a budget together that is aligned with district goals and objectives. So if you look at the strategic plan, we make budgeting um, decisions based on our strategic plan. In addition to the Elementary and Secondary Education Act, the Every Student Succeeds Act, which are our federal legislation on what programs and uh, learning opportunities we have to provide, what resources and programs we have to provide. And then in addition, we align our budget with the New Jersey Student Learning Objectives. So that's the context of our curriculum, right? The, the meat and potatoes of, of what we do and why we're here. So our planning process begins actually pretty much in the fall. In October, I put together a launch packet uh, with Ms. Hopla to our leadership team. And so from there, they get uh, from pretty much October to December to start building their budget. So they might look at programming they're offering in schools, um, what they're doing within their departments, and then they build a budget. And throughout the month of December, each building administrator and department supervisor, administrator, comes to myself and Ms. Hopla with their budget request, um, making sure they have strong defenses if, if they're putting some new action items in there that weren't previously budgeted for, their rationale. Um, sometimes we ask for some quotes for different items, you know, depending on what the, re the requests are. So, you know, that's kind of a walk work in progress for about, a, you know, usually the month of December. Then what happens in January is that um, Ms. Hopla and I review the request, make sure that you know it's within reason, that we can fit it into our budget, because we also have to look at higher budget items like the personnel budget, our healthcare budget, um, facilities budget, so we have some other bigger, higher level areas that we have to look at as well. And then all of the budgets are reviewed by the Finance and Facilities Committee, so you can see they met on February 21st, February 28th, March 2nd, and March 9th of this year. And then each of the building administrators or um, content area administrators, um, special ed supervisor, director, they come and they essentially defend their budget to the finance and facilities company uh, committee who asks a lot of great questions and, and really digs deep in terms of what the vision is and what we're, we're projecting to spend our money on. And then obviously tonight, uh, our preliminary budget is open for public comment and for discussion. And then in addition on May 1st, it will be as well for a, a final, final vote. So in terms of our fiscal budgeting process, what Ms. Hopel and I do with the administrators is uh, their budgeting has to be on uh, three levels. So like a level one priority item in a budget is a legal requirement. So if it is, for example, part of the New Jersey Student Learning Standards because that curriculum has to be met, those learning standards have to be met, so curriculum writing, uh, if the state pushes out, the state's pushing out new math and ELA standards. So we have to align budgeting and allow for curriculum writing for that. So when the state pushes out a mandate, if it's special education, all of those are top priority legal requirements that we have to do. A level two requirement is required by board policy. Uh, for example, where units to graduate, therefore requiring higher level staffing or changing that kind of thing might require, um, if it aligns with our board policy, we align our budget to those level two options. And then level three budgeting is not required, but high investment from the community. So meaning it's something that we're really passionate about and believe in. Uh, for example, um, you know, investing money in our music department or mental health programming um, it could be DTRAC, the middle school math program. Those are things that we uh, believe as a community that we want to invest in and then we budget for those uh, items. So that's how the budgeting philosophy is done. 
So our preliminary budget and our budget in general, we look at um, some fiscal responsibility. So what we have to really look at when we budget is the continued increase for students with disabilities. Uh, so this year alone, I believe one of the committees reported back, uh, if not I have the, the numbers in my Google Drive on the number of uh, special ed students um, has significantly increased this past year. Uh, we're seeing a lot of that, especially at the younger ages um, with speech and OT uh, needs, um, possibly from the, maybe as a result of being home during the pandemic, or we're not really sure we don't have the, uh, a rationale, but our increase, uh, the numbers of students have, has increased there, um, and then throughout the district as well. So we have an increase in uh, costs for students with disabilities, uh, facility maintenance, so we do budget for facility projects. So you'll see that in the board agenda tonight. There are some uh, facility projects we're gonna be putting out of um, our facility maintenance reserve to pay for a number of projects, including a fence to give some extra play at, at Irving, so the facilities company will, uh, committee will go through some of those things. In addition, we have federal and state mandates that we have to be fiscally responsible for. Contract obligations, so when we look at budgeting, we have to look at the union contracts, both for the admin and the teacher union and staff union, to look at um, increase in costs for those obligations. And then, of course, the um, increase in transportation costs, which I know we've been communicating since we've come back into school even last year. Um, I know we're not the only school district feeling, feeling that, but you'll see that, for example, in the athletics line items, the our athletics budget has gone up because the amount for transportation has gone up. And unfortunately, after school activities limits the availability of school buses, so we have to have coach buses, and those are even more expensive, but we want to make sure our students have the opportunity to get to get to you know their activities, their sporting events, and stuff like that. So you'll see that in the preliminary budget. Um, what we're really proud of um, with some of the information that we'll talk about in, in an upcoming slide is that our budget will be able to at least maintain that our schools are fully staffed with qualified personnel. So I'm excited that we'll still be able to maintain that. Um, we don't have to increase class sizes at all, so I don't have to cut any teachers, which is great news. So we can maintain our current class sizes, which is great. Um, we'll still be able to provide robust instructional resources. We're gonna update and align to some of the standards. So some of the work you'll see in social studies, curriculum writing, ELA, music, things like that, and the arts. Um, we'll be able to maintain all of our wonderful and robust instructional programs that we have. Like I said, you'll see on the list, we're able to even do some more facility maintenance projects, um, in addition to some broad grants to really um, push our facilities in a, in a, in a more forward um, direction. And then um, still continue to provide courtesy transportation for students on hazardous routes. In addition, our budget will enable us to provide uh, facility upgrades. So we'll still be working on some facility upgrades as part of um, the budget for next year. We're gonna begin our five-year plan to expand preschool to a full day for all three and four-year-olds. So you'll see that, um, although preschool money is in a different budget item, you will see the modular classrooms as a, a non-preschool budgeted item. So we're able to increase, uh, to have an increased space due to um, you know, the expansion of our budget this year, uh, for next year. We're gonna open up uh, a bunch more special ed classrooms, um, which required, uh, required more personnel, both paraprofessionals and special ed teachers, as well as resources for those classrooms. Outfitting a new LLD classroom, a new ABA classroom, and all of that requires a lot of facilities um, and resources. In addition, our personnel will actually be able to increase the addition of staff to support that increase in enrollment. So um, our, our budget predictor will allow us to increase staff to meet the needs of our growing population. So let's get down to the bare bones, Linda. Let's do this. Okay. Do you want to talk about our revenue? Sure. Uh, well, the good news is that the state is um, getting closer to what is uh, considered to be adequate funding uh, based on the formula that they came up with many years ago. Um, and this year, the um, state has given us an increase in state aid, which for many years we have been in increases, so this is very good news. Um, so we are seeing an increase of 1636000 in um, state aid. Um, the next line where it uh, talks about anticipated funds, in order to balance the budget, we need to anticipate 
uh, that we are going to have savings in this year uh, that will be able to support next year's budget. Um, and so we are looking to contribute a, uh, just under $2 million, $1,999,000 uh, from leftover funds from this year to roll into next year's revenues to support the budget. Uh, we will be doing, we'll be describing projects that we'll be doing, uh, it's on the agenda as well. Uh, we're transferring from our capital reserve fund to do major projects. Um, one is a um, phase in uh, cost of the replacement of the boiler in the school. And uh, we have two applications for what are called ROD, which stands for Regular Operating District grants, which the state will be funding 40% of the cost of these projects uh, related to an electrical upgrade part of school, uh, unit and replacements, uh, which are the heating units in each classroom and also uh, major roof replacements at both Irving School and New High School. Uh, so that's capital reserves. Maintenance reserves are smaller projects uh, that sometimes are done in-house or they're just uh, not uh, what would be considered capital. Um, so there's a lot, there's about seven or eight small projects. Um, things like fencing, uh, maybe replacing uh, some carpeting or some PCT flooring. Um, yeah, the baking, those are the baking. Uh, yes, oh yes, installing baking detectors at the Blue Vanilla High School. Uh, some security grade replacements. Right, and yes, security rates. Um, uh, transfer from emergency reserve. The emergency reserve, uh, by its name, is for emergencies, but there is one uh, use that we take advantage of. Uh, we put money into this reserve in case we have health benefit costs that are excessive. And this year, we saw a 15.6% increase in our health benefit payments. So um, in addition to asking the state's permission to uh, utilize a waiver um, with regard to property tax increases, we are also tapping into our own reserves to help uh, plug the hole um, in this, this increased budget. Um, extraordinary aid is um, aid we get from the state that we're anticipating that is to cover special education related costs that are excessive uh, over and above uh, what they consider to be average costs. Uh, when we have things like individual, like one-to-one -one nurses or things like that, they're very expensive. And so the state does give us aid to help cover that. Uh, in the past, they've only covered about half of it. It's been higher in the past two years, I believe, more like so we are anticipating the state will give us a, uh, a good chunk of money um, to help cover those costs. And the tax increase, uh, we are looking for a tax increase of 194767 which is within the statutory limits. So uh, here's a list of some of our proposed expenditures. Uh, so we're looking at, you can see the changes um, on the right to what is proposed. So we do have an increase in school supplies and extracurricular activities. Again, a lot of that supply chain issue, a lot of the cost of things have increased. We're opening up some new classrooms, so one-time uses of outfitting a new special education classroom or things like that with resources is um, important, including furniture and, you know, three keyboards and blocks and all the other stuff that these classrooms need. Um, so district operating questions, including over capital improvements that um, obviously has also um, gone up. Um, we've had an increase in uh, curriculum, instruction, and professional development that's gone up slightly. Again, the state seems to be moving a little quicker with their changes in curriculum, so we've got a lot of work to do in, in making sure we're up to speed on, on that. Um, obviously, salaries and benefits, like Ms. Hopla shared, again, that is all uh, contractual. Um, special education um, salaries, which are also included above, but you can see the breakdown of our salaries and how much of that is special education salaries and costs. That has also increased because we've had, to, one, we've had a lot more special education staff, and two, we've had to pay a little bit more. It's very, we still have special education classes technically unfilled. We have them covered by special education teachers, but we've had to pull intervention teachers, and other programs because we just haven't been able to find the staff. So we're hoping in the spring we'll have some better luck. Um, I know we're not the only district um, feeling feeling that. 
um, the special education out of district placement, um, including transportation. So you can see, actually, for our out of district placement, the number of students has actually gone down, but the tuition has gone up. So hence why we see um, an increase in out of district tuition. They're really um, charging a lot more for for those programs now. And then the special education in district cost. Okay, and similarly, again, the, the breakdown for special education um, out of district cost, again, the tuition is up, uh, but the number of students is down, and then our special ed out of district transportation is slightly down. Fewer kids. All right, you want to talk about the easy? Tax and yeah. break, break. So this is, break, uh, this is a complicated <laughs> slide. So we are on, on a what's called a fiscal year basis. Our year starts July 1st and ends June 30th. But the tax bill you get is based on the town's numbers, which are on a calendar year basis. So the town does their budget, they take our numbers, but the timing of the taxes. You know, our new year taxes, you see half of those this year, and then you'll see the other half next year. So, and, and then the additional complication was everybody went through a re, um, revaluation. I want to say reassessment. Yeah, so there was a revaluation done in the town this year, so the tax rate is now very different. Um, your tax rate was five point something last year, now it's 1.493. So, but you need to look at the property average value of a home also changed. It went from 150,000 to uh, 479. So everything, like your, your numbers are very different. So it's hard to say apples to apples. So what I do is I say, well, what's the multiplier? Your the overall valuation of all the properties in the town went up by uh, three, three point, I forgot the numbers, three point something. But the value of a house went up by a multiplication of a little uh, different, lower amount. So your, this is, this is math, numerator um, <laughs> and denominator. So when you look at the price going up on the numerator side, but the what it's spread out over by the denominator, because your value is, is based upon all of the values in the whole town. So if, if all of the values went up by more percentage-wise, let's say they went up, we're gonna make it a lot simpler, but it's not like this close. Let's say they went up by four times what it was, and your house went up by, multiplied by three times then you're going to see less of an increase than somebody else whose value went up by maybe five times. Okay, just, am I making a little bit of sense? Okay. Yeah. So, now, our taxes are going up by 3.77% over the course of a fiscal year. This year, you'll see half of that. Next year, you'll see the other half of that. Now, because of the way that the taxes are calculated, it could, and I stress could, on if your house is an average house and it used to be valued 950000 and now it's valued at 4799 that's the average house. If you are one of those people that have an average house, you could actually see a decrease because the denominator of all of the assessed values increased more than the numerator of all of the individual house values. Okay? It's a very hard concept to, to grasp with, but when you look at your tax bill and you look at the rate you get, then you might want to take that number and, and look at what the value is of your house, and then you can make that calculation for yourself. Um, okay. I'm sorry it's so complicated, and it's... Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I hope I tried to simplify it. Well, on that note... <laughs> I'm sure there are questions. Yeah, so I'll open it up if there are um, questions from the board on our preliminary budget again with the main focus of understanding the big ticket items and to be able to balance it. Just important process. The board will ask question, can ask questions now. Yeah. About the budget, then we'll do the
for an extra presentation. The board had an opportunity to discuss that. Then we go to board committees and then public comment. So I apologize, it's going to take a little longer to get to the public. Public will then have the opportunity, of course, to comment on anything they'd like, but certainly we should be looking at these here if they want to. Uh, there's just the rest of the process as they follow. Okay, so this is the board of uh, our budget. I, I, I don't have a question, I have a comment. Um, I, 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 just to put Linda's um, discussion or um, explanation um, into context, if I understand it correctly, because of higher tax assessments in the town, it's been building in the town, the average tax on the average house is going to go down. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. This will be the third year in the last six or seven in which the taxes from the town, based on the schools, most of the budget is the schools, will have either gone down or stayed the same. In 2000, I believe 18 it went down. Last year it was essentially the same. I how you calculated it, but I calculated it went down by $10 a year or something. Um, and this year will also go down. So um, we definitely hear from people about the high taxes and they're going up. This year they're not going up, they're going down. And I think that's very important for people to, to hear and to understand. Questions or comments on the budget? Well, yeah, it was, it was uh, great, great uh, even though it was a lot of Thank you to the other budget. It was really exciting to see uh, all the fantastic things that are going on in the district. Um, so the, the, as Mark said, the, the 3.7 is not the amount that the property taxes will go up. But so, so it was 1.77 the exemption. I didn't quite understand that for the health care. It was the health care yes. exemption. Yes. Okay. You. you know, we've used that before. We've used that. My first three or four years on the board, we used that almost every year because the health care costs from 2015, 16, 17, 18 were also going up by enormous amounts of 15%, 14%. This year, 15.6%. Um, that's a million, um, about a million dollars, which is an enormous amount. It's crazy. Any other questions for board comments? Okay. Yeah, very pleased. Thank you. Yeah, I, <laughs> I, I, I mean, it's not the most riveting presentation no. to ever give, but I mean, it's you know, I think we're we're in a, I mean, I'm, we're grateful, honestly, the increase in state aid and the fact that they're getting uh, even that much closer to the actual funding formula that they proposed many, 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 many years ago. Um, I know some uh, other school districts are not; uh, they received some large cuts. Um, there's some legislation out there to help them, but you know I'm only speaking for us, and, and I'm grateful that they're getting closer to the funding formula, which allows us to continue the wonderful work that we're doing and expanding some of our programs and, and offerings. So we're very excited about that. I just wanted to thank uh, Chris and the other members of the committee, and uh, Christina and Linda, and all of our administrators. We went every administrator in the district. We went through every line item, um, there's a lot of line items, to look for what are we spending, what should we be spending, what can we spend. And uh, we've done this for years, but it's a very laborious after hours job. So I really appreciate the work that it, our staff and administration has done. So thank you. And I will say for the community, the board's finance and facilities committee is, is a tough it's a tough committee to present in front. They all are, but imagine as an administrator sitting there and essentially having to defend your budget um, and, and the particular items that you feel that are in the best interest of the students in your building or in your department and things like that. So it, um, it's, it can be nerve wracking, um, you know, to make sure that we're all aligned to the same, you know, philosophical beliefs in terms of the strategic plan and our goals and, and objectives and meeting our level of criteria. So. So thank you for, for being so detailed and invested in, um, in the district budget. And we move on to uh, another presentation. Another presentation. Uh, about our 
aftercare care program and what some thoughts going into that going uh, forward. Mm -hmm. So my second presentation of the night is on the before and after care. I'm going to call it a business because that's what it is. So we've been calling it a program, but I think a program is misleading because it's a business, not um, a district program. It's a district business. So tonight I'm going to pre present some information about the business to give you some background. In addition, I'm going to share some of the financial information, which I know has been shared throughout the past, you know, at least since last year when we were losing money in our, our PL, PL statements, profit and loss statements. So I know this has been something that's been communicated uh, periodically by the Board's Finance and Facilities Committee. In addition, I'm going to share some issues and concerns about running this business and uh, some recommendations for next year. So first, why I'm calling it a business. So it's actually what we call, in the industry, an enterprise fund. So it's a Highland Park Public School Enterprise Fund, which means that it's not funded by the district operational budget. It's a business operating under the umbrella of the Highland Park Public School District. So some districts, it's, so there's no state requirement to offer a before and after care program. That is a district, um, decision on what they want to offer, in addition, what they want to offer. So we offer an in-house enterprise fund in which the operations that are financed and operated in a manner similar to a private business or operation. So the DOE actually defines enterprise fund as operations that are financed and operated in a manner similar to a private business operations. What our program provides or what the business provides is childcare services for families before school starts and after school ends. So it's child care before school and child care after school. And a little bit of history as I dug up through the works of, of my research was that it actually used to be, we used to have in-house the child care program um, and also summer camps. The summer camp program used to be in-house and managed by the teen center many, many moons ago. Uh, a couple of superintendents ago, a superintendent that I won't name because I don't really want to hear his name anymore, but a couple, a couple of superintendents ago apparently um, gave the borough the summer camps. So they, we out, I guess, moved it out of the district to be managed by the borough. So now our summer camps are run by the borough. And then the child care program was pulled out of the teen center and given to that superintendent, Mr. Capone, at the time and then sort of give it to his secretary, my secretary now, to like kind of sort of manage. So that was sort of the, my understanding of the movement of this business from one department to another. Um, so that's what you see here. So the former su superintendent started in the district, the camp was given to the borough, and child care services was removed with no administrative oversight. So it was just given to a secretary and said, you know, manage this for us. Um, so that person managed uh, collections and registration, and then the site managers began managing the business. So our current structure, so we have two site managers. We have Ms. Draper, who manages our urban program, and Ms. Brescia, who is the um, uh, operator of the business at Bartle. In addition, it's mostly Highland Park public school staff that um, serve um, and work in the program. We do have some staff that come that aren't exact, that aren't employees during the day, but the very minimal. Uh, most of them are our, our current staff. We have somebody that does collections and registration. And uh, besides the site managers, obviously we have uh, our staff. Uh, we have the uh, regular staff. There's staff for special ed students, so if they need a one-to-one -one para, that staff, if they need a nurse, we staff it with the nurse, so we're fully ADA compliant in terms of our accessibility. In addition, uh, last year I implemented an on-call administrator. So what I was finding was that all of the business issues that were happening ended up falling on me. And so I would get the calls and have to tackle it, which was fine, but there was no, um, I realized that there wasn't a lot of oversight in terms of managing the, the the program. So I implemented an on-call administrator, so it's a staff member that has a supervisor certificate um, that's looking for some administrative experience um, in, in, the, in the school district 
and so they're on call as needed. The issue I've found with that is that it's a member of the same bargaining agreement as the most of our staff members. So I still have to be involved and conduct investigations when issues have occurred um, because they can't investigate people within their own unit during the day. So there have been some, some so we've been trying to put in some on-call administration oversight for this business, um, but uh, it's been partially successful. So some of the uh, fiscal information. So um, obviously there's a fee structure that has to happen for any business to stay in business. Um, and what happens, what we found is that to, to the knowledge of anybody that has had any workings of this program, it has never changed. The fee structure has been the same since at least the early onset of this program which means that inflation has come and gone, the pandemic has come and gone, right? Costs have increased in food and resources, and we've never increased these rates ever. Um, in addition, we offer several options for days and frequency. So you can bring a couple of children and there's a discount. You can come for one day, two days, three days, four days, five days. There's an option too for one hour at a clip. So if somebody just needs one hour, they can pay a fee for one hour. So there's some flexibility with days and frequency. <clears throat> in addition, I know we've communicated the financial constraints of running the business. Um, we had a surplus in that account. The business had a surplus that was making um, some, some good revenue, except the uh, pandemic depleted the account because um, a previous administrator agreed to pay everybody, which was awesome, pay everybody during the pandemic when we weren't open for business. So the, the the people running and being part of the business were still getting paid, but we weren't bringing in any revenue to the, to the business. So, I mean, thinking about it in terms of that, if your revenue, because the district operation budget can't supplant that. So if the business isn't making any money and is losing money, then we have to cut things from the program because the district operational budget can't sustain that. Um, so it's important to understand the fee structure that we have in our district includes the following considerations. So it includes students on free and reduced lunch. So we have options for free and reduced lunch costs to families in need. However, that's subsidized by, um, by the cost collectively um, for our full paying uh, families. In addition, we have extraordinary services, like I said, such, such as one-on-one -on -one paraprofessionals and nurses. Um, in addition, there's snacks and programming. So I know that the business hires uh, staff to do tutoring and extra help. Um, so all of those are included in the financial information. So I'm not going to go through the chart, but um, when the presentation goes out to everybody tomorrow on the district's website, you can review the um, current tuition rate, like I said, have been um, in, in, in effect since as long as anybody can remember the program being in effect. Um, uh, my understanding is that many, many years ago there was a push to try to increase the rates, uh, but it wasn't successful. But these are our current tuition rates. And then in terms of the programming, what uh, the programs have to offer at Bartle, they offer gym for open play. They offer time to or for students to complete any homework or work outside of the classroom. They offer them a snack time and they get art. And at Irving, they have uh, anywhere Different, depending on the grade level and, and the day. Uh, they have outside time, gym, game room, or what they call creative play. So it's the op different options for play, and they get snack. Um, I know I've already kind of briefly touched on a couple of the issues and some concerns, at least from my perspective. Um, some of them are there's no observation or evaluation process of the staff. So from our um, collections to the site managers, to assistant site managers, to the staff, anybody involved in the program, like there's no other evaluation process. So I would, you know, nobody really knows if people are doing a good job or not a good job. There's no collection process of that. Um, in addition, my understanding is staff are not really um, equipped or trained in some life-saving techniques unless they have it as part of their work during the school day. So some of our paraprofessionals, for example, are handle and care trained because they are trained in their role during the school day. But like I said, not all of our staff 
are not all the staff in the Ford aftercare program are our daytime staff. So I'm not sure if those other staff that come to us that are not have any training in any of this. Um, I have no idea because there's no records on file if they are. Um, uh, again, staff are not all trained in handling care, which is our de-escalation and restraint techniques. And the de-escalation techniques are really, really important to diffuse the situation. Uh, again, if they are trained by us during the day, then that's fine, but there's no additional training for those staff. Um, and we do have a higher rate of students with challenging behaviors in, in the program. Um, and if you're standing around my office, sometimes it's just a lot of, you know, um, there's no, not as much de-escalation happening um, during those situations. In addition, we do have children being left sometimes until 6, the 7 p.m., so the program ends at 6. Um, so we do have students that are unfortunately left behind, in which case we do unfortunately have to call the police if, if a child is left behind. We try to communicate to the families and to their uh, emergency contacts and all that. No one's coming for the students. So um, they are charged beyond the 6 p.m. time. If we have to wait a little bit longer, there is a charge for that because, again, these people work it's an hour late to business, right? And, and so that's, that's important. But we do have um, issues like that. I mean, we have a ton of issues of, of liability in terms of understanding policy, understanding procedures, the training, and, and things like that. So there are definitely a, a, a bunch of issues, um, you know, getting called at 7 p.m. on a Friday night um, about, you know, about an issue. And because there's, there's, no, there's no oversight. So it's all coming to me, which is fine, except that I have no, um, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not running the business. I'm running the business of the school district, but I'm not running the business of an enterprise account. They're two different things. Um, so again, the, the issues and, and liability is a, is a huge concern from a superintendent's uh, perspective for the Board of Education. So what I did was I looked at some comparison rates across local districts. Uh, so I know the board has been talking about increasing the fee regardless um, of the situation because like I said, it's never been raised. And if you can see that respectively our costs are um, the lower of the ones that we were able to collect, I think Spotswood is is slightly lower, uh, but other than that, um, we're, we're in the lower end uh, compared to South River, but touch in, um, and you know, what I saw in another district that offers um, Catholic Charities was, was another one. So we were just kind of looking at some rates of what um, other, other districts are, are offering. What you need to note is that their fee structures are probably based on a myriad of factors as well such as like the number of students that they predict are free to reduce lunch in there, covering their costs. I don't know what kind of programming they're running and how much that costs. They don't know where they're buying their snacks and food, right? So, I mean, how much they're paying their staff. So, I mean, there's a bunch of factors that go into the rates, but it is important to know that we are definitely on the lower end of, um, of the rates. And you can see that some people don't even offer, like, breakdown of rates. Like Spotswood, for example, doesn't offer, like they have one, you know, before care, you know, it might just be an all-inclusive, like you pay and that's it. Versus how many times you come, you can see that four days, three days, two days, like that's not an option. So you can see that there's definitely some, um, some variety in, in what's being offered as well. But again, just to show you that we are on the lower end. So with all that being said, I have, uh, I've been exploring um, sort of two options. For, um, for the board to consider. One is that the Highland Park Public School District continue to run the business, but hire somebody to run the business. So that might be, for example, an assistant principal um, that may have a schedule of 10 to 6 or something like that at Bartle. Um, so they would be able to support Bartle um, you know, for, for some of the day and help us nap out with areas she needs, but they are predominantly also hired to run the business. That cost would have to be absorbed in the budget of, well, some of it, not all of it, but a portion of the um, salary would have to be considered in the fee structure of the aftercare program. So the district operational budget would cover X amount of this that staff member's salary because they're working for this the school district during the day, that disperses a certain amount of percentage. And then the other percentage, that money has to come out of the aftercare fund. And so we would particularly post for that position that has experience running a child care business. 
so they would know what is the training that has to be done, how often does the training have to be done, how are we evaluating people, how are we making decisions, and they're the ones that are, are running the business. So that's one recommendation. The other recommendation is to consider going out for uh, proposals to see if there is a company that can run the business, so outsourcing it, um, that can run the business, maintaining our amazing staff, um, and that has access to, to uh, a plethora of more resources. So um, regardless, both of them are gonna come with an increase in, in rate, uh, which like I said, we've been communicating for the past couple of months in board meetings. So I put together, um, Linda and I put together what we look like as, as a potential fee structure comparison so that um, the board has enough information to, to make some, at the start of some considerations here, not a decision, but considerations. So this would be the tuition rate comparison. So you can see the black is our current fee structure and the red is with a 30% increase. So this would be, with an assistant principal, a 30% increase. Again, we have not raised rates in forever, ever. So in order to cover it with the cost of having someone to actually run a business, that's what we would have to, to charge. Um, if we were to outsource to an organization, so this is just one example. Now, we have not put out before, uh, uh, bids yet. To go to bid does not lock us into anything. To go out for proposals just means that people can bid on our specs, and there might be a program that can come in at a cheaper option or a cheaper rate. This just happens to be one of them. This is a company called Right at School um, that I know is used by Scott Plains and South River and a bunch of other districts in New Jersey. One of the things I wanna highlight, so they, you can see that they're at about the same increase in the cost, so you can see our current pricing to what right at school would be off of charging families. But one of the things that I put, I want to draw your attention to the blue arrow, because I probably should have done it red to really make it stick out, but um, there are some things that these outsourced organizations can offer a school district or families in our school district that we can't. And one of the things I want to highlight here is accepts government subsidies. These organizations have access to money to help families in need with childcare that the school district does not have access to. I cannot go get government subsidies for families on free and reduced lunch. And we have families that cannot even afford, that have free lunch, that can't even afford to, to send their children. So right now, we don't charge them. But I, I can't run a business, or we can't run a business, by doing that to everybody. Because I don't have access to those government subsidies. So that is a highlight. They offer, obviously, you know, some, some different options, too, in terms of discounted rates, drop-in rates. Um, they can even offer childcare during non-school days, which we can't offer. Because my staff, they're contracted employees through a union. So it gets kind of hairy if they're also working for us for this enterprise account, even though it's an independent business, they're still operating as Highland Park staff. So I can't have them here for closed. But an outsourced company would be able to offer that. They offer stuff over the summer too, which our program doesn't offer. So they do have some more um, robust offerings. Like I said, they will hire our staff so you can put that in the proposal and say, we want you, we want it to be our staff because we love our staff, hire our staff, and they will. Um, they offer training and mentorship for the staff that they do. So some of the things that you'll see here highlighted that we're not currently doing in our business is injury and crisis response training. They do training and mentorship for child and staff safety. They do training on abuse and neglect signs and mandated reporting. They do uh, training and mentorship on child development, on positive guidance, curriculum delivery, leadership and management, and supporting students with challenging behaviors. Um, in addition, they offer, for example, this particular company I just happened to pull up, 
like so many of the other companies out there, they offer a robust amount of, of programming. So I put up our programming so you can see our programming that involves snack and some play. Um, this particular company, for example, offers uh, what they call a town hall and a snack, which is basically a check-in with the student. There's like a check-in, check-out. Um, it's built on the CASEL framework for SEL, uh, social emotional learning competencies. So there's a check-in and a check-out. There's snack. There's the right moves. They have a fitness class. They have homework help. They offer daily enrichment, health, wellness, and fitness fund, and self-directed inquiry. Um, like I said, their curriculum aligns with the social emotional learning competencies, and they offer seasonal curriculum through the daily enrichment um, in some of the health, wellness, and fitness fund. For example, I looked on their website and fall, they had Rev It Up and Mega Makers, so they were doing STEM work. Um, with the students, so each season it looks like they get some different options for enrichment and, and self-directed inquiry activities. So very structured um, opportunities for, for learning with fun. So with that being said, you can kind of see a comparison of sort of those pros and cons for, for both options, but I wanted to put it out there and my recommendation would be for the board to consider the request for proposals and bids at this point. Um, to consider all the options before making a decision. So by approving at least tonight the request for proposal, it just means we're putting it out for a proposal. We would then form a committee of multiple stakeholders, look at the proposals, and we can compare them to the proposal for keeping the program as an enterprise fund, and then we can make a decision after reviewing the information as a way to support our uh, families. So I will open it up to the board for questions or comments. And I'm sorry, so thank, thank you for all that very detailed information. That was really helpful. Um, I mean, I, I personally don't feel like I'm prepared to commit to anything one way or another. And so we have a lot for study. Um, but in terms of, I mean, the price increases that we're looking at under either plan are significant. That's going to be tough for families and not just, you know, families, lunch families. What, when you talk about grants offered by some of these organizations, is that for people who are like below a certain income level? Would it, would it apply to some of our I don't know, wealthier, more middle class, not free and reduced lunch students? Would they also be able to get assistance? What do these grants look like? Yeah, so, so it depends. I'm not familiar with the, the um, government subsidies and, and grants, but um, we can certainly ask for the proposals for them to put that put those list of offerings together. So reviewing proposals, we can see what those options are to know if that's a good move for our families. Yeah, no, we need to, right, we need to know the actual cost yes. our families would likely be, yeah, and right. how much so the application paperwork on their part, on the family's part. Yeah, yeah so I do know they, um, these organizations do have people on staff that help them complete, and if they have people on staff that speak um, both of the languages as well to help families complete the necessary paperwork to, to get it done. And then what they do is they said, that it takes sometimes a couple of months for it to be processed, but they don't charge them, you know, like and while the right. process is happening. So they don't have to pay any kind of full rate or anything like that. So they work with the families um, to be able to provide the, the child care that they need while their paperwork is being um, handled. Yeah, I assume they get a, 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 a track. Yes, yeah, yeah. State yeah. agency, whatever yeah. it is. Absolutely. Um, okay, yeah, that'd be great to find out what the actual is. Okay, yeah, we'll put that on the, on the proposal. I, um, I uh, have a contact in uh, the district in uh, Union County, um, and they go, uh, so the subsidies are through the Department of Education, they have a, uh, 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 each county has a, an organization that, too, that, the, uh, that, that the Department of Education, let me speak into the mic, that the Department of Education uh, funds, so in this specific district, students that are on free and reduced lunch pay nothing. I mean, we give them a reduced rate, they pay nothing because the DOE is picking up the tab through this, Good. Uh, these they organizations. But that also means that since the families that can pay are not subsidizing the families who can't, cannot pay, the overall rate for everyone goes down. Hmm. So the families that are free and reduced school lunches aren't paying at all, and the families who are um, able to pay are paying a lower amount. Um, and of course, one of the reasons that our numbers are on the very low end currently, um, I, I looked at inflation rates from um, uh, 
uh, you know, the, the, the federal government's numbers on inflation over the last 15 or 20 years. Um, inflation would have us, uh, given the current rates we're paying, which have never gone up, we would be the highest on the list if we had, you know, and had, you know inflation, right. key, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So this is probably a good time for us to at least look at what can we get from an organization who's officially getting the DOE money to 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 support the families that can cannot pay who need who need this program the most. Right, no, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. So uh, I think it's personally I just want to say I think it's really a, an excellent idea to find out and also in either case have a full time administrator or at least a most time administrator to make the program more robust than it's been. So the administrator, we talked about, uh, you know, potentially in, in AP at, at Bardo. How would you envision this person splitting their time? Splitting, would it be mostly AP work? Well, if, if it was a 10 to 6 situation, it might be like a 60-40 or 50-50, like they might need time when they get into, you know, they might not actually start until 11 or 12 right. doing like AP work. They might need an hour or two in the morning to do business work. Um, or something like that, and then um, you know maybe you know three three hours or something like that to help them borrow three or four hours, and then they, you know the other time so it might be fifty fifty or sixty forty or something like that. So a significant amount would still be going to the uh, the during the day school. Yes, program. yeah, that's great. Okay, thank you. I have a oh, it's just a quick question. First, can you share this to the drawing? Because I had a hard time with the numbers. We I didn't see it in the drawing. Yeah, it's hard yeah, to put it. All right, I'll have Susan put it in there. Yeah. Okay, thank you. And then, um, I'm going to ask about the board. Yeah, my board notes, it was also the presentation. Yeah, I was going to say, I put it in my board notes. Sorry. That's okay. That's okay. I'll just do the stream. Okay, thank you. I don't spend any time on those board notes. No. Sorry, it's been a long night of presentations. I had to go. Yeah, that was my problem. It's okay. Well, I mean, first, yes, I, like Mark, do feel like it's a good time to start looking at possibilities for outsourcing for that. I mean, obviously, some of the information you shared about what's happening and the concerns that we have are legitimate. We hear it, I think, probably all the ability with our friends who have student uh, children in the program, or our own children who are in the program, um, and what happens after school does impact the culture in our schools during the day. So if we have uh, children being handled in a way that um, just goes against the what we're trying to do in terms of establishing a better culture of care and you know, therapeutic support, um, restorative work. Um, this is uh, contributing to undoing that work, I think. So I, to me, I feel like just, I think the qualitative aspect of programming, um, if we can address that, we will see that economic and feasible way, it benefits everyone that certainly contributes to what we're trying to do. So I know it's a business technique, these are children, um, they're in our schools, and this is happening in our, on our school property, so there's, in their minds, this is all part of the school, right, their school experience. So I think it's really important that we kind of just focus on the benefits we can have that. Thank you. Yeah, so we, was the AP figure, was that on the basis of the AP, uh, the assistant principal for Bardo? So we, I'm sorry, the what figure? The, 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 uh, so, so the, the, well, the, in, in the estimate, maybe this is, but the, for the assistant principal at Varno, is the idea that they would be the person that would be hired as the yeah, so we would it, Yeah, so we would post it that they have child care business experience. And when, when do you expect to post that, John, at? That would be, well, we have to decide. I, mean, I can't post a job that I'm not intent, so there's no job posting now because I don't know if we're offering it. So what we would do the okay, so the next steps is once we approve tonight the request for proposals, yeah. we will go through that will be posted publicly. People will submit their proposals. We'll put a committee of multiple stakeholders together. We'll get some of the people that run the program. We'll get some parents that utilize the program, some board members, myself, whatever, and we'll go through. There's like they give you um, a, you know usually a rubric and a ranking, and we'll review the proposals. We can look at it against. The in the in house model. From there, we need to make a decision um, if we find a company that can offer more robust programming at a cheaper rate and more access, or something. Let's just say something like that. Then we can go and formally accept that proposal. We can you know do a presentation on that. In which case, then I wouldn't post for that. But if we want to keep the in house, then I would have to post for it. Okay. Thank you. 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 Th
but you, you wouldn't post it at all because I thought we were hiring an assistant principal. Right, well, but, anyway, but, but the posting would be different if right. I'm right because I mean, if I'm posting something that's a 60 40 split or 50 50 split, I need something that actually has experience running a childcare business. If I'm hiring just a full time assistant principal at Bartle that's full time assistant principal, then they just need so that experience so versus being able to run a childcare business. Yeah, the other question I had was about what, what, is, what is the, uh, what's, it's not called the solicitation, what is it called again? Uh, a a request, request for proposal, oh, yeah, RFP. A request for an RFP. Um, what does it look like? I mean, do, do you say we want somebody to run a program for one, two, three years? Do we want, like, do you specify the options or do you just leave it sort of open and they, they you can get in touch with them to communicate? Linda, do you want to jump in? Well, it's a one year contract with the option to read it. And with a uh, professional service, it can be an indefinite uh, Other contracts are limited to uh, five years, or one with three, one year renewals. Uh, but I believe that this would not be restricted. We wouldn't have to go out for our new RFP every, let's say, five years. Mm -hmm. We're happy to throw it. But they have to be evaluated every year and decide to renew it. And do you, do you specify the options that you want? to offer at the beginning? I mean, do you say you want them just to offer a one day a week thing? Or, or yes, we would have um, for, yeah. many, many page long many specifications, pages. <laughs> like six or eight pages long okay. specifications based on all of the details, and that would be included. With, with that would include some of the concerns. We have email about serving students with disabilities in the after school program that the, the RQ would include. Yeah, that it had the ADA compliant and like all the training, all those, you know, good, robust curriculum programming, you know, that kind of thing. No, I mean, we were compliant before, but like, I, I, I appreciate yes, you for, yes. for adding some. Yes. Okay. Well, because we'll have to include that, that we have, you know, nurses, that we have right, one-on-one yeah. -on -one paraprofessionals, that we have, you know, certain criteria that, that our population that we need to meet. We would put that in there. Like Linda said, it's about 60 pages long, um, all of our specs. <laughs> Okay. You know, which is important, so that they also know too the space, like how much space is available for you know, like this is what we basically it's like here's what we do. Who wants to bid on it? Right. right. Does that make sense? Yep. Okay. Absolutely. I didn't realize it was so long in detail. Yeah. 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 Michelle wants to speak. Oh, okay. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Michelle. Yeah. Hi. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, so I left my camera off because my computer is not doing great, but. Um, I wanted to know um, how we could go back to the management system that we had before Susan took over at the direction of our former superintendent. Because um, I thought, you know, it would be ideal if we could have someone to oversee the program, not so much manage it in terms of paperwork and, you know, administrative type things, but to to oversee it in a way that it could be um, a little more reflective of our values at, at school during the day, um, because I'm not just, I'm not sure if I'm understanding you know what we would be getting in terms of hiring this out, you know. So it seems like keeping it as in house as possible in terms of I guess curriculum um, or values or whatever you want to say making sure that it's, it's a Highland Park after school program and not just an after school program, if you know what I'm saying. Um, yeah, so that was my only questions about kind of curricular management versus administration. So I, I will say that um, the, the, because it was managed in the teen center, I do know there was significant cuts with the DCF funding, but I don't think that's an allowable use of the right now, um, the, Majority of the teen center's salary is um, is part of the funding we get from the Department of Child and Family Services as part of the SBYSP grant, the School Based Youth Services Program, which I know I spoke about at the beginning of the year when they were trying to cut the funding and cut our mental health support. We saved the funding for another year with the guys that we're trying to figure out how they even take in the mental health funding as part of our operational budget so that we don't have to rely on the stress of the DCF cutting our robust mental health program. So um, right now, it's not something that I can put back on Elizabeth 
um, in her office just because we are not allowed to. <laughs> so I think regardless, I, if we keep it in house, I mean, it doesn't have to be an assistant principal, that would be my recommendation since they would be working out of that building, but we have to pay somebody to do it because right now it's not allowable use for us because remember, it's an enterprise fund, um, so I have to pay somebody out of that fund. So the price would have to increase regardless of who manages the program. We'd have to increase regardless because we're hiring another person. Or, in, or if I'm giving, so if I put it, even if I put it out to the principals now, or somebody, uh, an administrator, right? An, an actual administrator, not a teacher with a supervisor, mm -hmm. and I say, okay, I'm going to pay you, I don't know, whatever, however many hours, six, six hours a day to business, six hours a day, times five days a week, whatever, I'm going to give you $30,000, $40,000 a year extra to run this business. Well, then I can put it out to the administration and say, okay, who wants to make this money? But I still need to figure out those costs. Right. But that would be something that I'd have to, I'm still bound by another union. I'd have to go to the HPAA and they navigate that. And now I'm, you know, again, it's now I'm tell, telling a, an administrator who's probably here since 7, 7.30, 8 a.m. Now they have to also be here till 7 p.m. or 6 p.m. or 6.30 for this program versus somebody who has a little bit more flexibility with their time than coming around like 10 or something like that, you know? So it, it, we have options. Yeah, and, and the, the concern now, I mean, I understand that like these programs, if we were to adopt one of them or accept a bit, um, you know, they offer like a more robust curriculum and so forth, um, you know, potentially more training in certain areas. Um, is the problem now with the administrative part, is it, it just not working out with our current limited employee resources. <laughs> yeah, yeah, because the, so I do have somebody who is an on-call person, but they're not. It, they're just somebody on call to help with you know parent complaints and things like that. They're actually not running the business. Right. Um, and now most of the time, if there's issues with staff members, that person can't even do it because they're in the same bargaining right. agreement as these people during the day. So now it's it's on me. So I you know an issue happened um, on Friday. And that was my call Friday at 7 o'clock. And then, you know, the month, not much I could do over the weekend. And then first thing on Monday, I had to come in and I had to change my schedule around to conduct the investigation, which is fine. I, you know, that's part of my job. But conduct the investigation while the supervisor was able to talk to maybe some of the students. Then we meet, and, you know, on here's, here's my directive. But it has to come from me because they're not... Like legally allowed to do that. Even when they're working for an enterprise fund, and I mean, we always talk about how the after school program is like separate from how it, it works. So, but, but they still can't. It, it, but it is, but it's, it's not because they're, they're all in the same bargaining agreement during the day. So it makes it very challenging to separate the two things. So it's not necessarily illegal, but it's like weird and awful. Weird, weird and awful, yes. Weird and awful, okay, got it. And the union hat does have some pushback. I'm, I'm sure, I'm sure. Yeah, yeah, no, I can see where it would complicate relationships. Yeah. It just doesn't. You know, my question is that if all were equal, you know, we'll find out once we get bids. If we could take the, this responsibility off the plate of our current administration or Dr. Cozier or anybody else, there are a lot of other things that need to be doing. You know, okay, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Initiatives and so many things we want to keep moving forward. If, if it was all equal, we'd feel better, or close to equal, we'd feel better, I think, from the perspective of how our staff operates to have an outside organization. And I think liability also becomes a liability. I think becomes a liability of this other agency, other corporation or company. I guess in terms of doing so. That's just about the thing. Once we get our bids to look at it, that's about. So we would obviously still be sued if something happened during. <laughs> <laughs> so, but I mean, the idea that like the legal theory would support. I mean, it, I'm not sure how. We would have to put more things in place. Obviously, you never know what's going to happen. But we made the efforts to put. More precautions. I feel like it's a better situation. And well, I don't think it's going to happen, but right, right. It's just, yeah. a, just a piece of puzzle. Yeah, no, great. Thank you. Oh, sorry, just one quick uh, thing I forgot to mention. The children being left late, like, I know this happens when kids get picked up late after school program like that. Um, I was just, I guess, my mind should be too old. How big of a problem is this? I mean, it's in your bullet point list of you know, issues and concerns, and you know, what, what you have more data on that. I mean, I don't have the numbers, but I mean, I get calls more often than not of, of that happening, um, of 
then, then we had to do that. Because, I, and because anybody knows that if police are called, I need to be called. Because I need to know why police are, are coming here. And um, yeah, yeah, I mean, it's been calling more It's un unfortunate. Um, really unfortunate. Would an outside contractor be able to hear that change? Yeah. Would that change? Or they just yeah. like. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not sure, but I don't know what their protocol is. I, I don't know, and that would be part of it, is right, looking at what their protocol is for how they handle students that are, are left behind, I don't know. But again, it was, our protocol is whatever they've done. I don't have, right? Like, because there's no board policy, there's no, I mean, we, go, we govern our, we govern our board policy, but in terms of the aftercare, the policy for aftercare is not robust enough that it really gives us a roadmap. So it's, it's basically what the administrators do during the day is what Ms. Raber and Ms. Priscia do as business owners and operators. Yeah. I, I know you didn't have the numbers, but maybe at some point we could get yeah. a little bit more sure. um, data on just you know, what yeah. size of the population is being most impacted by this, how many students we're talking yeah. about, what's the frequency like. It's, I know for me, it's, it's alarming. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Of course. course. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, so you guess, yeah. yeah. This is, these yeah. are things that do spill over to the perception that kids have when they walk back to right. school building and that's how they are being exported. Absolutely. Oh, oh. So, so the, oh, I'm sorry. I come in. Uh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. It's a bad habit. <laughs> <laughs> um, are we so, able to move on or do we Well, I have one more comment, which I'm sure you're all dying to hear. Um, so, I mean, it's, I wonder if the, the RFP could include, you know, if, if you have a lot of students that Getting home by six, maybe we need to offer an extended care option. Right, right. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
uh, professional development. Uh, okay, Dr. Close reported that staff have been working with a new consultant, well, not new to staff necessarily, but we were not aware. Ms. Brewster, in the past, who has worked with staff, is now currently in talks with the administration to come and provide some summer RP training. Um, and so I think that that's something that is in the works now. I'm trying to come up with uh, perhaps some plans for, again, having that service to support staff in programming that will hopefully, hopefully also help our students who are um, you know, struggling in various areas and are impacting their discipline records. Uh, we also talked about the New Jersey Consortium for Equity and Excellence and some of the professional development opportunities that are offered through that particular membership that we have as a district. Um, Dr. Kulcher will be updating us uh, their next meeting in terms of staff participation in those particular trainings. Uh, and then we also looked at um, or discussed uh, just an item that Jen mentioned that, that at last month's Board of Health meeting, there were high school student uh, liaisons who discussed a uh, few recently completed student sur surveys at the high school, one of which asked students what they know about restorative practices. Uh, and a lot of the high school students indicated, according to their study results or their survey results, that they didn't know what RP was. And uh, they were requesting more student focused RP instruction. So it's nice to be able to talk about professional development for the adults, but now also thinking about um, the students and their need to either kind of get a refresher because of the pandemic um, impact of over the past couple of years in terms of post practices or, or be introduced to it for the first time for some of the students. Uh, so we discussed the possibility that um, our Dr. Pilcher actually not just discussed, discussed the possibility, but ensured that she would look into providing some new orientation to RP for students who uh, need that at high school. Uh, then we talked about upcoming policies, which we all know on the horizon. Uh, we will be making administrative um, uh, changes to our substance abuse policy, just having to revisit that um, uh, due to the state's change in certain um, substances. So we'll be looking at our policies and belonging as we did. Uh, and then we also will be um, leaving off the service requirement of our high school graduation um, policy change or adjustment, I should say. So still moving forward with adjusting requirements for credits, the um, administration has decided to leave off the service requirement just as they want to do some logistics on that particular component of that policy change. Uh, and that is it. Yes, that is it for now. Questions from Andy? Sweet. I just want to add something really quickly that um, the fencing that you mentioned at Urban is really timely and wonderful because if you do the modular classrooms that are going to take up a lot of the black top space, at least it'll be replaced with some green space for the kids, at least. Um, we weren't sure that was definitely happening, but it's happening with you know, multiple ways we can fund it, but it's happening. So, yeah, really yeah, strong time. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, we're going to move on to finance facilities, and Chris, you do have a lot of things in mind. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm, you know, I'm not sure how much detail people want to hear. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Yeah.
professional musicians, file bank for file storage, and uh, book delicious for the old school books. The item 20, uh, as we did just discuss, uh, even though it might have the appearance that this is some kind of moving in some direction, in fact, it's not. All options are still open, and uh, there'll be a committee formed. Uh, I assume that parents who are interested in serving on that committee should they contact you. Yeah. Uh, 21 is approval of disposal of equipment, 22 is the preschool program plan budget. Uh, 23 uh, is the lease of the uh, two units with two classrooms each of the uh, modular classrooms. And that, that turned out to be even cheaper than we were expecting. Just a good job. That's <laughs> for that's a really reasonable price. Um, 24 is the reserve fund balance. And, uh, uh, yeah, I didn't I didn't cover the uh, items that weren't in bulk because they were covered in the workshop last week. But feel free to ask any questions about them. Questions for finance facilities? Okay, uh, we're going to the personnel and we have to do the bold items. Okay, let's go over the bold items, which are to do. Um, uh, blah, blah, blah. What was it? Please. I'm going to the page again. <laughs> so, I thought I had it. I thought I was already in the room. Alright. So, I actually, number eight is a new one. I'd like to set that aside for a moment. Um, and maybe other new ones first. Number nine, we have a new paraprofessional at Bardo. Welcome. 24, uh, approval of scheduled duty appointment. There is, I don't know, one second. Baseball. Okay. 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 Under the scheduled B chart on number 24, take off or keep, I don't see it keep on the agenda. So I have a, a read in here. Personnel for uh, the baseball, post baseball coach is Benjamin Jacoby, Jacoby, not Cornelius O'Keefe. But as I look at my number 24, I'm not seeing one thing. Where is O'Keefe? O'Keefe's not there, it's blank. Yeah. That, for the, this is, oh, for Mill, oh, that's, I'm sorry. This is from Mill School. I didn't realize that was part of the header. Yeah. yeah, it's blank. In any event, this, the, the proposed baseball coach for the Mill School is Benjamin Jacoby Jacoby. Um, my apologies to him. Uh, number 25, approval of staff to attend the incoming ninth grade orientation. We'll get some extra hours for uh, three staff members. 26, approval of PD, professional development preparation, presenting hours uh, for two activities, two professional development activities. And number 27, approval of after school treatment team meeting. Um, those are for, okay, for our ABA program, so that the clinician and all the other teachers and parents and stuff can get together and meet after school for those uh, complicated classroom situations. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm jumping around number 21. I didn't realize it was bold. Approval of change of staff for the Title I Building STEAM program. Uh, we are going to have a new substitute for that program. Okay. Um, the one I had some concerns about, number eight, the middle school youth safety specialist. So this was a uh, this was a necessity, a last minute change, because we needed to fill that position. We we thought it had been filled. Um, so, Dr. Nicosia had to move quickly. It's my fault for not reading, reading the agenda in advance on the 16th. I had not seen this until just tonight. Um, I'm sure this individual is a wonderful person. I'm a little concerned that we're hiring somebody who's a career corrections officer for this position. That does not really seem in line with our, the values we've been trying to inculcate. Um, it is, however, a little awkward to talk about that at the board table um, because it does involve potentially a per confidential matter about a potential staff member. Um, but uh, I don't know, I'm, I'm not comfortable with it, but I wish that, I wish I had read the agenda on Thursday. And I wish, I wish we were hiring somebody who had a background in restorative practices or in social emotional learning or in 
one of the areas that we emphasize. In any event, we are the uh, agenda number eight is uh, approval of a new food safety specialist for the middle school, Jason Jablonski. That's the proposal number eight. Questions for personnel? Or agenda number eight. Uh, I would just have to comment to that I have the same concerns that Ann referenced about the, this person now that we're looking at being in this position based on the background. Did you, did, excuse me, did you both have the same concern with the uh, person who's new in the high school? It's not conversational. Oh, we can't, we can't speak about this. Excuse me. I think you mean, we can't talk about this. I will, I will add in that same thing for all of our other uh, personnel. They will have uh, the training. We do have money set aside to provide training um, for the staff member. Of course, thank you. Any other questions? Or? Okay. The only other uh, um, committee is line for policy. Nothing new. The high school graduation is like the first week. We'll talk about that next week. So now we're going to move back to public comments. Uh, now we'll move to public comments. Um, that. The Highland Park Board of Education welcomes public participation and has reserved this time for your comments. Board Policy 0164 and 0167 establish and regulate the right of public participation in public meetings. So as we always do, this is a three-minute uh, for speaker opportunity to um, share your thoughts. Uh, when it's when I call on you to tell us your name and your address, um, we'll be having a speaker in the room, so we'll start in the room. Hello, can you hear me? Okay. Yeah, very well. Thank you, uh, Joe Sanio, 208 North 3rd Avenue. Good to see everybody again. Hi, how are you? <clears throat> So the first time I was here a few weeks back and talked mental health and sleep benefits regarding the uh, earlier start times at uh, Arlington Earth. Last time I brought survey facts that did not reinforce your decision. And this time we're going to talk a little bit about safety. Uh, my daughter is uh, uh, currently in Barlow, is currently walking during a fairly well-led time in the morning between 7.45 and 8, 8 a.m. Feeling steady. Well surrounded by many other children, including a period students, middle school, primary, and some parents. <clears throat> this is a walking town. This is one of the reasons why I moved to this town to begin with. Everything is fairly close to the walking distance. My wife and family believe in an active lifestyle and encouraging our children to walk to school. <clears throat> My daughter has about a six-step mile. It takes about 15 minutes. <clears throat> On the far side of the town, would probably add another five to ten. As our daughter gets older, showing confidence in her independence by allowing her to walk on her own is important to us for her growth. From early December through mid-January, our pattern the sunrise doesn't begin until around 7.20. You have not considered the sun will not be completely visible immediately. Factors like morning shadows, cloudy skies, icy conditions, and inclement weather decreasing visibility for both walkers and drivers. A 15 to 20 minute, five minute walk with an arrival time of 7.30 to 7.45 would require walkers to leave their homes between 7.15 and 7.25, well within the winter sunrise time frame. Asking my children to walk at the crack of dawn in the winter, you're putting them in danger if walking, if walking or now forcing me and many others to drive our cars for an unreasonably short distance. This would increase the traffic flow even more throughout town exponentially increasing the risk of walking even more. Your proposal will now force my daughter to walk in the dark, in the shadows, or even worse, all alone. Hundreds of other parents are not comfortable with this idea whatsoever. My daughter and countless kids need extra sleep, extra time, and more light, and more eyes of accountability. Will you hold yourself accountable if you don't take these factors seriously into consideration and someone's safety is compromised? Your proposal forces us to get up and out even earlier than we've already struggled with. It baffles me how you continue to stand firm for a start time change that there is no overwhelming support for outside of this board. 
Regard, regarding the ongoing litigation against the Board of Education, the judge was misinformed. Let the record state that yes, the high school and middle school was given ample time regarding start times, but no one from Irving or Barbara was ever informed in a respectable, timely manner time. prior to the announcement in January. Please be sure to mention that to the judge. And let's not forget one last point after you just go to the start of budget. Now I want you to hear one last point. Now let's think about that you just now put hardship on these parents, not only to get them out the door more, but now to put them in aftercare even more, and surprisingly enough, make them actually pay more out of pocket in order to pay for that after, that after school program. Keeping them even further away from their parents and costing them more in the long run. So please take that into consideration and end this litigation. Let's move on. And I, I'd like to know what your definition of what a proposal is, My guys. Your time, time is up, sir. Your time is up. I understand, but I want you to see how serious that I am. We, how we understand. Your time is up. Because I don't know if you guys are listening. So please start to listen, because it's important, and it's safety for our children. And your time is up. All right, well, I hope you're listening now. Thank you. Anybody else in the room that wants to speak? Hi, my name is Carla Draper, 126 Amber Street. Um, I have worked in the Urban After School Program for about 20 years, and I've been the site manager for about 17. I've seen a lot of changes through that time. So I just want to let you know we 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 did some cutbacks this year. We had to. And, and we've really worked hard to try to make things work. Um, so just so you know, we also had to cut back on some of the things that we do. Um, we, do ha we did have an arts and crafts person. We did reading with our first graders, knowing that they had reading, not really homework to do, but, but some of them wanted to go home and be with their families, so our teachers would read with them. We also started doing kindergarten reading time with them, story time. Um, and also, um, you know, just, we were able to do more. We had a great team come in and do programs with them, but that all had to kind of be scaled back this year because we didn't have the money to do it. Um, but I just want to tell you, I'm very passionate about the FRA After School Program. Um, so I just want to tell you a little bit of my feeling about it, if that's okay. Um, so this is what how I look at it. We offer the comfort of familiar faces, like Shane, draw pictures with the kids, Mr. Monty, who knows her car, before you even get out. Uh, Miss Joyce, ready to give hugs. Miss Linda, always willing to give a push on the swing. We provide consistency. Um, we can follow through on the school expectations. We can support teachers. We add services, administration, and helping with all of our needs. We are inclusive. Our program is a direct reflection of our diverse and close-knit Highland Park community. We are a family. All are welcome to join us, and I call our students my kids, and I mean it. I just ran into one of them in Walmart the other day, and my husband goes, who is that? I said, it's one of my kids. Um, so I'm asking you to keep our program run by the board of ed. Let's invest in the program. Let's research options and other options and funding. Let's reach out to the community and parents. As I was sitting there, I reached out my son as a firefighter and I said, hey, are you CPR trained? What can you do? Can you, can you figure out a way through the department to get someone's LCPR trained? Let's continue to allow our children access to a program with amazing potential, led by educators and staff who care for them like they do their own kids. Thank you. Okay, two more speakers for those people online. Okay. Um, okay, good afternoon. Um, hi, good evening. <laughs> uh, good afternoon, everybody. Um, I just, um, ah, uh, sorry, uh, Christopher Espinosa, I live in Dupasway. Christopher Espinosa, and I live in Dupasway. Now, my, um, just like last week, my issue is still the, uh, the model of classrooms and giving. Um, I heard today the issue of fencing that seems to be a big solution. Um, my concern with the, the uh, model of classroom experience, in case some of you have not been here, is that it will expand the number of students that will considerably reduce the play area, the play area that students can use, whether it rains or not. Um, 
uh, if you find it outside of Irving, because of the rain, kids will not be able to play them. In the same way, they cannot play the playground. So I have an issue that there is not data on the impact that the expansion, the more students in the school will have on the educational services, because we have less space playing area, less than fifty percent of impact of far more students, and no assessment of data have been collected of the educational impact of that. My other issue now comes with the money I mentioned. I was just saying the budget for twenty three. And it's 83,000 plus, plus the monthly uh, monthly lease, which if my numbers are not right, that will be 179,000 over the two years if we include this year. Plus the 400,000 for the service hookup and cost of the month classrooms. What could be a solution about more than half a million for something of two years? Uh, I, I think maybe we should need more thinking. Uh, like, Maybe bring some other solutions. I think maybe we have five years by the state to really think about solutions. Maybe we should be taking one more year extra, finding solutions to address the need of people because I understand people need this. It's, I don't want to be empathetic with them, but at the same time, I'm really concerned with the lowering of the quality that uh, we for, for the quality of education because no assessment has been done. And now I'm really concerned about the financial impact of a solution that is just for two years. I, I think that it's over financed, like over half a million for a two-year solution. Um, it's a mixed concern, and uh, that's why I would, I would urge you to take more time before approving the model of classrooms to be in Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hi everyone, um, my name is Rory Steve Lorenzo and I live at 440 Cedar Air. Um, we're here, I, I, it's my first meeting in person. I do try to participate online. I do want to take this opportunity to thank the Board of Education for offering these type of meetings. Thank you, it's very appreciative, especially to those who have children at home and can't be here in person. So thank you for that. Um, and listening to the agenda and just giving an overview, we all care. We're here because we care. We care about the community, we care about the students. I do, like most others, have concern. I have concerns. I wanted to come here before I even saw your agenda. And then when I saw your agenda, I thought about the active care program. Miss Carla, my son, is in the active care program. She as well as others, you know. They're very dear and nurturing. There could be other issues that I'm not being aware of at the other schools, and I appreciate, I understand that you do want to make considerations for outsourcing. That's fine, but you know, and I heard and I'm listening tonight that you um, were considering, you know, the staff can be involved and stuff. As long as you don't change this, there seems to be, and one of my concerns, if I wanted to come here today, too many changes all at once. I understand. I'm not looking at the numbers behind the budget, but you have the the you know the mandates associated with the pre-K students and stuff. I would like more information on that, seeking in terms of providing, if it's not on a website, maybe the individual just advise me if I need to email someone where I can get information about the state mandate, you know, the citation of okay, over the next five years, you know, we gotta do this. Um, Dr. Nicosia, I did listen to your pre-K information meeting um, with, with um, um, Principal McNally. We learned a whole lot about a whole lot of things and stuff. One of my concerns was um, actually about the module of buildings. Okay, I understand. I, you made it perfectly clear. Pre-K students can't be in the module. They got to be in the classroom. You got to have the kindergarten to the first graders and stuff. And one of my concerns was that okay, new year starts in September. You have the new students come in. Fortunately, I have a child in the 3K program, loves uh, Irving, is familiar with Irving, not a concern. My concern is you have these other poor students coming in, pre-K, first time in public school, and let's then a month later, you have the influx of all the pre-K three and the pre-K four, and I understand, I'm not against it. I just am so concerned that there's too many changes happening all at once. I drop my son off every day. We've been going to pre-K for what, six months? I still see children that are crying going into the building. I see um, I've had to help personally help some students get into where they kind of resist it. They're just, you know, I know you guys have a lot on your plate. 20 and, seconds. Okay, thank you. Dr. Nicosia, I know it's very ambitious. You know, you stood up there, you know, I wanted to be, you know, have this program, 60 students in year one and stuff. I'm not questioning your decisions on that. I'm just saying that maybe 
just take the consideration to slow down a bit. And also, I'd like to know who might kind of reach out to email for additional um, questions about things like, for example, the fencing. Jen, you mentioned the fencing. Where in Irving? Is it in the front of the building, by the garden area? Is it around the corner? I don't really know, and I couldn't tell from that. I know my time is up. But I just wanted to also say about what you guys were referencing about the serving on the committee of before aftercare. I would be interested in that as well. I just wanted to mention that. So thank you. Mm -hmm. And for, for all our volunteers, as you can see, we're taking back to Cozy takes copious notes and does respond. We don't respond to what we comment. We use the time that it does get responded to. And some of mine are just quite like, I just don't know who I'm supposed to respond just to. Just in general, so we know that it does, information does go out to you. It's like in a nice way, and not less. I appreciate that. <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'll follow up, but always know that you can email me directly. Okay. Uh, we're going to go uh, to our hands online, and I think Liz would like to your hand first. Keep it as Anthony Bob. So if you want to start, so then uh, that's pretty good. Um, yeah, thank you. Um, Elizabeth Wild Kramer, 6107 Valley, Highland Park. Um, honestly, I don't know where to begin. Um, I came on to listen to the proposed changes for the ASP program um, and to make sure that the ASP program, whatever happens with it, that it abides by the ADA and if you have a nurse on staff for kids with medical needs, but now I'm seeing that there's a proposed 30% increase, there's a consideration of privatizing the program. I think both of these are absolutely horrific ideas, and I would love to see from the board table some reaction, some passion, some emotion, because these are things that are going to directly harm the families in this town. We have a very mixed income community who are putting you will, if this increase happens, ASP will be out of reach for families. If you privatize it or outsource it or start calling it a business, that is gross, that is disgusting. And let me just say, my son's been at ASP since kindergarten. Carla Draper, who just spoke, she is the reason he got through Irving. It was entirely because of her that he was able to walk through those doors, that he was able to be at ASP, that he thrived there. That was because of Carla. Um, so that was what I was going to say, but then I hear that you're going to hire a former corrections officer to work at the middle school, and like, with all due respect, like, what the hell are you thinking? You know, I'm a reporter, I cover prisons and jails. You know what I cover? I cover CEOs abusing people. That's their training. They're trained to look at people as the enemy. You cannot train that out of someone who is a career corrections officer. And again, I would love to see the board actually show some, I don't know, anger, disgust, that this district is even considering having someone like that in the district. I don't want that guy near my kid, and I don't want that guy near any student in the middle school. You know, he's already pulling a pension from the state, right? Why, why are you giving him a job? Why are you hiring a former corrections officer from a youth prison in New Jersey? Because I just looked him up, and that's who he is. Why are you hiring him to be around the students in this district? It is disgusting, it is wrong, and I urge everyone on this board to respond and, and forcefully say, absolutely not, we will not do that. And that's all. Thank you. Sarah? Yeah, Sarah Pixley, 3 Grant Avenue. So again, I just wanna echo that I really appreciate this forum as just a way to share our public concerns. And I think, um, you know, get our elected officials to hear our voice and, and really represent us. Because I think what, you know, again, I, I just like Buffy, I helped on this and and hearing something very different than, than that we were here. And, you know, what we're hearing is we're proposing an increase in aftercare and potentially charging for free lunch. We have one of the largest populations in New Jersey, uh, proportionately using free and reduced lunch. This is just on the heels of the families of 500 to 600 lower school children bring their kids into school earlier in the name of equity Walk in the dark under dangerous conditions this is what we've heard the past couple weeks. Families are really going to suffer. Spend less time with their kids and more time in aftercare. So, you know, my very first question to the board with the earlier start times, I think, was a really logical one, which is, what does this mean for aftercare? And that was kind of brushed off. And um, now we're creating a situation where parents are needing to rely on aftercare, starting earliest in the entire district at 215 for longer because of the changes. It's an, it was an obvious implication, one that would disproportionately affect at risk under represented groups. So just, I think to whoever spoke earlier, just compounding the increase in reliance on aftercare, all of these changes, 
increase in potentially cost for, for the food they consume, it's just absolutely catastrophic um, for those we say we're trying to protect. I mean, these two things together are, are, are really concerning, and everyone here should be on pretty high alert. Um, you know, so we need a lot of questions answered, so let's just make it simple. Um, let's see the comparisons, cost to out of Sydney, Brunswick, Piscataway, other districts with similar socioeconomic profiles. What are those numbers? None of those were in the comparisons that were shown on the board. Um, also, we commit to communicating these increases in costs to those currently using aftercare. That is a not on starter for this, so they can have a voice. Um, also, I saw from salaries, they are increasing um, by proposed 7%. So to me, that seems like it's part of the budget, if I'm understanding these numbers correctly, when the national average um, increase in merit salaries is 2 to 3%. So where is that additional money going? And it certainly could be in, in the increased um, uh, personnel needed to run this program. So all of these things, you know, uh, we all all did for something different. Um, and I would just say we're all really listening now. So I, I, I would hope you um, answer some of these questions. Thank you. Uh, yes, uh, first off, uh, thank you to the board members. Uh, for you introduce yourself and your address. Oh, sorry. Uh, I'm only time for that 15 Albert Court. Um, thanks to Dr. Nicosia for the detailed presentations and to the board members for all you do as total volunteers. Um, and I wanted to comment about the before and after care. Um, I think it's a good idea to improve the programs like and address the structural issues that were mentioned, um, whether it's in-house or um, an external company. I see the pros and cons to both. Um, but in any case, I wanted to advocate for some more flexibility being built into the options that are offered to parents and to families. Um, Half-day coverage uh, being offered, uh, like so parents could just opt in to half day coverage would be really helpful at least for our family and i think other working families um, non-school day coverage would be a great thing to have um, flexibility so like some kind of punch card 10 day or drop in day use options um, and i know it was mentioned that there is a one hour aftercare option but i've never seen that i don't know how to access it and i've looked through the aftercare material before um, and if the start time and uh, end time does shift earlier for Irving and Bartle, um, and even if it doesn't, I think it would be useful um, to be able to um, pay for aftercare, like a shorter option, not necessarily all the way to 6 p.m., perhaps until 3.30 or 4 p.m. I know there are a lot of parents that just need it until then, and that kind of shorter option at a more affordable rate um, would be ne more necessary, especially if the start and end time shift earlier for the tip for being an article. Uh, that's all. Thank you very much. Thank you. Laura, Laura, I saw your hand next. Hello. Oh, sorry. Hi, um, this is Laura Espinosa Wallach um, at 148 Ducos Lane with my son Bernardo here. Um, I would like to speak about three different issues, all that are affecting the same group of kids, those who are currently students at Irving. Um, I'd like to start first with the um, the proposed start time at Bartle, which obviously the students currently at Irving uh, will be going to Bartle starting at 745. Um, as I mentioned a couple weeks ago at a previous meeting, um, I'm very concerned about the safety issues. Um, there are not sidewalks and we live in the triangle section of town, and not every street has sidewalks. We live on Duplos Lane. There are no sidewalks on Duplos Lane. It's an extremely busy street. Um, cars frequently go 40 or 50 miles per hour in a 25 mile per hour zone, which is not the board's fault, of course, but it's not safe for children to be walking on streets in the triangle district before the sun rises. We live 1.2 miles away from our adult school, according to Google Maps yet are not eligible for busing, and we do not own a car. So it, it, I'm just very concerned about safety. Our next door neighbor also, his son will also be, is the same age as my son, so they'll both be going to Bartle at the same time. There are many kids who live on our side of town who are going to be walking to Bartle School before the sun rises with no sidewalks. Um, the second issue I would like to talk about is the modular classrooms, which is also affecting the students at Irving. Um, I'm just very concerned that 
um, has, as has been previously mentioned, um, spending $100,000 to install the modular classrooms does not sound like a very temporary solution to me. Um, I would like to hear what the board proposes for after this like temporary two-year plan. Um, and I would also like to ask that all the board members um, go to Irving School during the day to see how often the blacktop is used. That is the only space at Irving where children can play basketball, soccer, where they have scooter days. Um, so it is a very utilized place at Irving, and we're concerned about um, the students not having a blacktop to use at all in the school. And then the third comment um, is about the after-school program changes. Um, my son is also an after-school program at Irving, and Miss Carla is amazing. I reached out to her several times with, um, my son has had trouble adapting to the after-school program. I reached out to her several times. She gets back to me immediately with very warm, caring suggestions. She reaches out directly to his teachers and to the guidance counselor at school to help alleviate any concerns that we have. She is fabulous. And having the same staff, a lot of the same staff um, at school and the after school program makes a huge difference. Um, and also, we think that raising the price of the after school program by 30% in one year is just impossible. We, we do not, we cannot afford a car, but we do not qualify for reduced lunch or free lunch. And we would not be able to afford the 30% price increase. Um, it's just, in, in one year, that's just, it seems very unfair for a lot of families in this district. Um, and as other people mentioned, that with the Bardo starting time we being moved so much earlier, a lot more families are probably going to be needing after school care and won't be able to afford it. So it just, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Uh, Abby, you're up next. Hi, I think I think you called on me. This is yes. Abby Darren Cardinal. I live on uh, Harper Street. Uh, just a couple of quick comments. Um, one thing I just wanted to mention in terms of log a, a logistical comment, I'm having a lot of trouble hearing and um, a lot of what's said, and I did check with a couple other people who said they were having the same issue. Um, and I, I really just want to emphasize how much I appreciate that you guys are offering this hybrid uh, option for people to call in, but I have noticed that um, when the people who are on mute and maybe using a neighbor's microphone, I'm not sure if that's what's happening, but um, when we are listening online, I, like Marilyn Cruz, I'm having a lot of trouble. So I just wanted to mention that as a logistical issue, um, just from the side of things. Um, I'm also just very concerned about hiring a um, youth safety specialist in general. I don't know the background on that. Um, at all, but specifically someone who is a correctional officer and has that background is extremely concerning to me, and I appreciate that being noted, and I don't know what the process is for that, if that's already a done deal, but if it's not, maybe that could be looked into further. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Nicole, Samuel, I saw you next. Yes, I can barely hear you. Can you hear me? I can hear you fine. Yeah. I can't hear you fine. Okay, um, I actually want to speak on a number of things, actually. Um, first of all, the school start times are still problematic. Um, you're forcing these children to get a lot less sleep um, and even have to do after care if they can afford it. Um, so um, that's all I'm going to say about the school start, start times for now because I'm pretty sure you guys are very aware of how I feel about that. Um, but uh, as far as the after care, it, it, it's highly problematic. People like in my position, I have food don't qualify for a reduced lunch, but, you know, who also don't have the budget for aftercare will have to work a lot less. Um, I'm actually forced to not work as much as I need to because I have to, you know, get my kids to school and with a shorter, the different start times that's also going to uh, hurt my money-making abilities. Um, the other problem I have is with these supposedly short-term modular trailers for preschool, um, I've seen schools before. These have never really actually short term. They seem like a short sighted idea for something that's going to have a long term process. And I would like to ask of you, all of you to take the time to slow it, break on, think a little bit more outside the box here, and think of better ideas of how to um, put these younger children in, in these classrooms and make preschools more available. And my last thing, and this is, this is the top part, the fact that you guys are even considering putting a CO in the school where my kids go, being a person of color, a Latina, really, really disgusts me that you would even consider that 
knowing that CO police officers are usually the ones who target children of color. And the fact that this is supposed to be a diverse and progressive town, I'm, I'm, I'm insulted by the fact that you would even consider doing something like this. I mean, honestly, I, I'm at a loss of words at this point. I mean, what is going on with this court? Where, no, nobody's listening to any of the parents, it seems. We've been coming from meeting to meeting. Nobody seems to be, to be thinking about anything long term. It seems that everything is just rushed through, and regardless of the pushback, you still do it anyway. And it is your reasoning. Thank you. Thank you. Carly, uh, not. Uh, hi, um, I, I also wanted to thank you for making these meetings. Oh, um, Carly Farber, uh, live on 2nd Avenue, South 2nd Avenue. Um, I have a daughter at Irving, and I wanted to thank you also for making these meetings hybrid. Um, I appreciate it. It definitely opens up the possibility for me to uh, be a part, um, an active participant and, and uh, in what affects my child um, so much every day. Um, and, uh, and like m most of the parents who have commented on here, um, I am also concerned about the same, the same issues. So I just want you to know that I'm opposed to the earlier start time with Bartle for all the reasons that people have already stated. Um, I'm very concerned about it for safety reasons, for, for health and family reasons. Um, I strongly support the Irving aftercare program as it is. Um, Ms. Carla is wonderful. My daughter's in that aftercare program. We can barely afford two days given our family's budget. And to raise the fees, I, you know, I think the, the thinking maybe is that if you raise the fees, then the program gets more money. But if you lose people because they can't afford those raised fees, and I don't think you're generating any more money for the program. So I, I think at least at, in, at least in some sort of much, much smaller increment, um, the aftercare program has been a blessing for us. We were not aware of any one-hour option. Um, so uh, we've just had to resort, resort to a part-time option um, uh, just to, to use that, but it is a great program. And uh, I used to work for an aftercare program uh, as part of a nonprofit, and uh, that was offered free to the students um, in the school district where I worked. And uh, I, I think it, it it's really important that the program be a, a part of the public school district. Um, what I saw with uh, trying to work together as two different organizations supporting one school. There is all sorts of problems that arise. I would much prefer to see this be a single public school entity uh, and continue to be the way it has been. Um, I'm, I'm disturbed talking about aftercare as a business. I understand that um, frequently I, I find in politics uh, when you start hearing something described as a business, um, you start hearing it also uh, finances, and, uh, and, and quickly you lose the humanity and it's just about the bottom line. So I am um, against the Africa program and I'm also against the modular trailers at Irving. Uh, that blacktop is essential to the playtime that the kids have. They all use it, um, and it and you take away half their play space when you put trailers there. And finally, I'm against the uh, corrections youth officer. That's something I just heard about tonight. And that is very, very disturbing to me as the mother of a child of color. The idea of a corrections officer at, at, at the middle school uh, for safety is absurd. Thank you. Thank you. I see no other hands online, so we're going to move on with the agenda. Would you board action items? Um, curriculum and instruction, marketing, moving. Yeah, I'd like to move items one through six. Second. 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 Ms. Colvin? Yes. Ms. Gallon? Yes. Mr. Krieger? Yes. Ms. McFadden, do you know 
Yes. Ms. Cruz? Yes. Mr. Leslavich? Yes. Ms. Gordes? Yes. Mr. Woodward? Yes. Uh, finance and facilities. Uh, yes, I'd like to move items 1 through 24. Second. Ms. Coleman? Sorry, I'm just catching up. Sorry, I'm just catching up. Take your time. So, let's finish here. Yes, there's so much to go through tonight. Yes. Yes. Ms. Gallon? Yes. Mr. Krieger? Yes. Ms. Kavanagh, take the phone? Yes. Ms. Cruz? Yes. Mr. Rice Levinch? Abstain on 22 and 24, and that's on the right hand. Ms. Borges? Yes. Mr. Woodford? Yes. Um, can, can Ms. Samuel please mute her mic? Nope. Hold on, I'm working on it now, I'm sorry. <laughs> okay, you should be good. Personnel and uh, communication. Uh, yes, a question first. Dr. Nicosia, if the board were to table number eight, the safety specialist, would that be feasible for the administration? So that we can discuss it in committee, um, even, well, I guess our board meetings a month from now. Would it be feasible? I mean, yeah, just, we just would delay starting yeah. anybody for the next board meeting. We only have one in April. And it's very end, so it's your workshop and your voting again, April. Okay, so I'd like to move all the personnel items uh, with an amendment as to table number eight. Do we need to vote on the uh, amendment or on the, uh, no? How does this go? Motion. I, I'll second the tabling. Is that your first person motion to table number eight? Yeah. And then a motion to move the rest. So should we get the motion to table first? Okay, I move to table number eight. Second. Coleman? Uh, yes, although I guess we were tabling this. Tabling is first. Tabling is first. The motion to table number eight is, is, is first. I'll draw it out right now. Okay. Thank you. That was a yes? Yes. Oh, yes. It's so processing because it has to be faced. It's a lot. It's, it's a lot. Time. Time. Ms. Gallon? Yes. Mr. Krieger? Yes. Ms. McFadden, David Cole? Yes. Ms. Bruce? Yes. Mr. Reslovich? No. Ms. Borges? Yes. Mr. Woodward? Yes. Oh, I'm sorry. So, I'm never okay. Okay. moving press, but yes. I was trying to move one through 27. No, I was trying to move one through, you say 27? One through 27, except for eight. Second. Yes. Ms. Coleman? Yes. Ms. Gallon? Yes. Ms. Schoenberger? Yes. Ms. McFadden, Jane McCullough? Yes. Ms. Prince? Yes. Mr. Ms. Levinch? Yes. Ms. Voorhees? Yes. Mr. Woodman? Yes. Okay, and last uh, is policies. So I move um, that the I move uh, the high school graduation policy five four six zero. Second. The first reading. Second. Ms. Coleman? Yes. Ms. Gallant? Yes. Mr. Krieger? Yes. Ms. McFadden Di Nicola? Yes. Ms. Bruce? Yes. Mr. Rosland? Yes. Ms. Voorhees? Yes. Mr. Woodward? Yes. Okay, so we're going to move to board liaison reports. Does anybody have a report from one of the uh, uh, groups that, they, that they're uh, attached to? Jen? Um, I have one thing to share from the Board of Health meeting. I actually was not able to attend this month, but I've received an email from the chair. Okay. Um, something, something to share. Um, they discussed the teen mental health first aid training program that some districts in New Jersey have implemented. Um, the chair will be doing some additional research on this and we'll share what he finds. The Board of Health members thought 
that a program like this would be timely and valuable for the students in our high school. And they'll follow up with more information from the street. Thank you. Anybody else have something to add? Uh, no, I don't. Oh, did somebody else already? Sorry, I wasn't watching you say. Um, I was not able to attend the Human Relations Commission meeting this month. We do have some questions for the commission. Um, I think I would rather uh, let me let me pass those along to the administration uh, separately, and then we can maybe discuss them at the next meeting. Sounds good. That's a good point. Anybody else? I did want to ask our liaison to the Board of Health if there were any discussion recently about the start times. Yes, I, I brought that up, I think it was at the last meeting where they showed their full support of the start time changes. Thank you. Yeah. Sure. Yeah, and by, by the way, was the, the proposal of uh, you know, move, moving the high school and, and middle school times later Bartle learning times earlier was proposed at the September Board of Health meeting in 2022, and we were also supported then. And, and, and discussed in 2017, 18, and 19, and supported then by the Board of Health. The, the earlier start times? Yeah, we discussed that we had the busing issues. Oh, oh, I didn't know we had that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, cool. That was Thanks. Correct. Thank you, thank you. No, appreciate it. Any other current liaison reports? Okay, seeing so that, we're moving to um, President's report. The only thing I have, this is really simple for regular events and stuff, is if you have not done your annual training with the School Boards Association, you're going to be getting the year. I am on Thursday. I put it off three times, but I'm doing it. So if you have mandated, if you have not done your annual training, the end of the year is December. It's on June. Or, yeah, it's a board, the board here is the calendar year now, and this changed a few years ago. So, not that I want anyone to delay. It's possible that the December one will be the end of the year. Yeah, yeah. 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 to uh, back to public comment. Uh, the same drill, have the proper education, welcome to public participation, and reserve this time for your comments. Um, the policies 0164 and 0167 establish and regulate the right of public participation in public meetings. So if you have something you'd like to say, um, please, as before, raise your hand or just uh, announce yourself. Abby, I see your hand up. Hi, thank you. Um, and I can hear you a little better. So, yeah, okay, I'm talking into the mic. I think that's the issue. Yeah, no, I, I, I don't want to do that. <laughs> thank you. Um, Abby Stern Cardinal again. I live on Harper Street. Um, I just wanted to clarify I was on the Board of Education for, a, or I'm sorry, not Board of Education, Board of Health for um, a little while. Uh, granted, not back when they talked about start times, but I did hear a little discussion about it. And I believe the support was for the later middle and high school times. Um, I would ask that you get clarification um, about the earlier times for Bartle and Irving, if that's what you're saying that they support. I, I, I hadn't heard that they supported, or that they supported or not supported, but that they gave a specific um, response to that. So I do know that they support the middle school and high school later times, um, and they might have known that there would be ripple effects, but I don't believe that they have yet discussed, um, and I could be wrong if there were additional conversations, but I had not heard any uh, further conversations about that. So I just wanted to get some uh, further clarification if we're you know, relying on the Board of Health as a source of um, authority on that. Thank you so much. Thank you. Anybody else for public comment? Seeing none, I move that we adjourn. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you very much. Thank you for the public staying with us.